This podcast is brought to you by Shift Management Supervisory Leadership Certificate Course, where online learning and live web coaching bring out the very best in frontline and middle managers. Move from operations to management thinking and develop the skills for leadership, reaching your company goals at the same time. Check out our Supervisory Leadership Certificate Course on the shiftworkplace.com website today. Today on Culture and Leadership Connections podcast, I have an esteemed guest and colleague, Dr. Whitfield Andrew Knight, uh, more colloquially known as Andy Knight. Yes. And uh, Andy Knight is a professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Alberta and former director of the Institute of International Relations at the University of the West Indies. A past department chair at the University of Alberta, Dr. Knight has had a distinguished career as an academic and scholar in Canada and was named a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 2011. He serves as advisory board member of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on the Welfare of Children and was a governor of the International Development Research Centre from 2007 to 2012. Dr. Knight is the author of several books and journal articles on the United Nations and Peace. He is currently co-editor-in-chief of African Security Journal and has co-edited the Global Governance Journal from 2000 to 2005, during which time he was vice chair of the Academic Council on the United Nations System, which is quite impressive. It's a global list of accomplishments that people can't even imagine doing one of those in a lifetime, and you've accomplished all of those. <laughs> I even scared to ask how many books you've written. <laughs> you know, I, that's a good question because I, I don't even remember the number of books I've written, but I've written at least 10 books and um, edited or co-edited a number of others. So the list keeps growing every day. I'm now working on one right now for Polity Press and hmm. they gave me a contract before I even wrote a single word. So I'm trying to, I'm trying not to meet their deadline <laughs> at the end of the year to try to get this one done. But it's, um, yeah, it's been a, a, a terrific um, career of teaching and writing, and, and that's what everybody loves to do. Well, I'm sure that there's more to your life than teaching and writing, which is a very, already a very big thing. Yeah. And the international work that you've done, particularly with helping children in war, which is yeah. how I first heard about you initially, it has a huge impact on the world. Like it, it makes people's lives better. And that's significant. There are very few academics that could say that. You know, they ask questions and they describe problems, but they don't necessarily make people's lives better. And I, I think you have really taken that to that next level. Yeah. But I know you do other things as well. So why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself sure. in a more holistic sense. Sure. Well, I'm this little kid that came from Barbados. Uh, everyone should probably visit Barbados at some point in their lives because it's such a beautiful and peaceful country. Um, and I was lucky because I grew up at a time when uh, Barbados had already become independent from Great Britain. Uh, and I had relatives, uh, incidentally, in politics as well as in religion. My dad was a minister of religion, a Protestant church, and my uncle was in the politics. And so there's a whole side of the family that were into politics, so the other side of the family into religion. So I grew up in this kind of a, a very interesting environment where things like justice and fairness was central to everything that we talked about at home. I didn't see differences of color because we had uh, on, on my grandmother's side, who's part Irish and, and part black. Uh, this mixture on one side of the family. And we never sort of paid attention to differences of color for some reason. I, it's one of the things that struck me when I came to Canada uh, to find situations where people were so powerful about color. And uh, we never did that for some reason in our, in our family. I think part of it has to do with the religious influence too. This notion that we're all one people, we're all from the same source. We all need to be concerned about each other's well-being regardless of what culture we're from, what background we're from. So that's the kind of environment that I think I grew up in. And my mom was a, was a housewife, um, not because she wanted to be a housewife, but because she felt it was important to have a stabilizing influence in the family. Then uh, her husband was constantly moving around and uh, going to different countries and spreading the word of God, if you will, um, to different parts of the Caribbean and also parts of the world. So, yeah, so, so this, this is a, the kind of environment I, I grew up in. My mom was really the stabilizing influence in the family uh, because my dad was not around a lot because he was more concerned about, you know, saving souls and uh, preparing messages for Sunday churches and invited as guest speaker in different churches. 
So a lot of it has to do with being in a place where we, we have certain normative values that were instilled in us because of my father's background, particularly, but also my mother's uh, quiet background uh, of instilling that kind of uh, influence in us as well. And then, of course, um, relatives who were in politics. So I, I grew up listening to a lot of uh, information about the United Nations, and that led me and drew me into the kind of work that I do today. From an early age, I, I knew of ambassadors who actually were at the UN in New York, and, and, and we had conversations with them at home, and, and they were talking about their interesting jobs. So naturally, you would sort of want to be like them at one point in your life. Um, as you grow up. So there are lots of good, you know, good role models and so on that they followed. The, the other thing is that when I came to Canada, I came more or less on my own. So I went to uh, Beamsville in Ontario and uh, a, a friend of my dad who was the principal of a high school in the area. Uh, he was the one that sort of took care of me in my first year in Canada. So I did a year of high school in Canada after finishing high school in, in Barbados and then went on to um, a master university uh, to do my undergraduate degree, which was in fine art. Of all things, I did political science and fine art. Uh, but uh, my focus in my early stage in the university was on painting, uh, sculpture, lithography, you know, being in the studio for many, many hours working on drawings and um, copper etchings and lithography and, and so on. I had a very, very classical art background. And most of my teachers, I found, were extraordinary in terms of their, their skill level and also because of their sort of very traditional approach to fine art. So I grew up in that, uh, in that environment as well. So a combination of art and politics, but also music, which is another dimension of my life that I, I cannot live without. That is my guitar, my piano. I grew up in church choirs all my life. Um, I grew up playing the piano in the church. Um, with my brothers, many of whom, I have five brothers, so they, we thought we were the Jackson Five of Barbados, I guess, because we had our own band and uh, we played all these different instruments and, and, and sang in choirs and I also played uh, on the radio for something called the Anti Olga show, which was a Saturday um, children's show. And we were like the stage band for that show. Uh, my sister, my baby sister, is now... Uh, the head of the orchestra in Barbados, in the, uh, both the youth orchestra, she, she's a lead violinist in the national orchestra. So I'm, I'm brothers who play in, still play music in bands on the island in Barbados, you know, so one is in New York, plays in a studio band. So we have this family that uh, is very, very musical, um, at the same time, very artistic. You know, I don't think I've met anybody who had a family that was so well-rounded. Or were you also sports stars? Well, it's interesting you mentioned that. We, we grew up in, in sports, but none of us sort of made uh, national um, teams except my young nephew, who was born in England, in Leeds, my sister's son. His name is Yona, and Yona is, is now an Olympic diver. Um, wow. Uh, dives in the Olympics. He's going to the next Olympics as well. You know, he's diving, interestingly enough, not for the UK, although he was born in the UK, but he made a decision when he was like 10 or 12 years old to make history. So his way of making history was to dive for a country that didn't have divers, uh, namely Jamaica, because his dad is Jamaican. Jamaica uh, doesn't have divers? That seems odd. It's very odd, but he was the first male diver to make it to the Olympics. So it gives you an indication, first male diver to make it to the Commonwealth Games, as well as to the World Games. So he, he's, he managed to get a, a silver at the Worlds, and he has this great future in sport. So I, I know that there's some, you know, we encourage our kids to get involved in sports. Uh, my, my kids got involved early in sports and hockey and soccer um, uh, and so on. But we, we were so involved in our music that we didn't have enough time for, for to become very, very good at sports, I think. That's, that was the same in my family. If you pursue anything with excellence, it does take time. And at some point, you have to make a decision what mm -hmm. you're going to continue to devote your energies to, for sure. This is really, really interesting. Let me ask you, you can share a couple of incidents from your childhood that you think were really formative. Could be also maybe from your adolescent years, too. First off, family is so critical. Uh, it seems to me, before I get to that question, people that I interview, either they had a family that they wish they didn't have, that they have tried all their lives to erase or ignore or, uh, you know, transcend, or they have 
had a family that was significant and continues to influence them and has a spreading influence through the generations over time. And it's really interesting to see that no matter what you do, the influence of family is there for you somehow. So for you, your influence of family was very strong and very positive. And you also must have had some very interesting incidents. So tell me some of them. Well, you know, it's, it, it starts, I, I think, in the church because my dad was not only a Protestant minister, but as many Protestant ministers, um, he also had a musical background and played the organ in church, believe it or not. And so I grew up playing the piano in church and being part of the choir, sometimes conducting the junior choir. We have the junior choir in our church, and I was the conductor of the junior choir. So I, I think part of this was this discipline that we had that was instilled in us uh, it, it, just for the music, but also this kind of um, uh, artistic ability to read music, but also to play by ear, which I think is something that um, a lot of people get a little jealous about, people who, who read music very well, but may not necessarily have the ability to play by ear. Uh, but we, we did have the ability to play by ear, all of us. And, and so we went off and sort of did a lot of interesting kinds of styles of music. I think that's one of the framing things for me uh, was the musical background and um, the, the ability to plug into different types of musical genres uh, growing up as, as kids. Um, and then, of course, it was on the artistic side. Um, we were constantly drawing for some reason at home. My, my mom said that I, as a baby, I used to draw on the walls of our bedroom. It drove her crazy. But anytime we had a crayon or a pencil, I'd be drawing on the walls. And uh, so they finally had to give me, you know, a sketch pad and, uh, or, or some sort of uh, thing to draw on because I, otherwise I'd be making a mess of the walls. Um, but I had this creativity uh, forced me to do these sort of things. And the creativity part and also the discipline of the music were very much part of what I became um, eventually. Um, but I have to say that um, growing up in, in Barbados, um, having... You know, relatives who were involved in politics taught me the importance of trying to meet the needs of others, not just yourself. Because these are people who were serious about politics, not as some of the politicians that we have today <laughs> uh, that may have a lot of self-interest, but rather the need to help others and to better themselves. And I found that there was a, a kind of similarity between listening to my dad preach in, on Sundays I listened to my uncle speak on the platform, political platform, on Saturday nights. The two of them sounded very much the same, <laughs> uh, even although the message was slightly different. But they had the same charisma, the same um, ability to sort of influence people through their, their words and to elevate people, to try to aspire to be better than what they are. Can you think of a time that you felt personally inspired to be better that if, you know, as you were growing up from, I mean, it sounds like you had a lot of influences, but can you think of a specific incident I know that when I sort of left Barbados and went to Canada, I made a decision actually during the university, my first year of university, uh, to try to help others. Um, that came from my background. And I felt that the one way to do this was to run for student president. So I ran for student office and uh, I became a member of the student union first. And then in the second year, I ran for president of the student council and became president of the McMaster Student Union becoming the first black person to hold that office, but also becoming uh, a person who garnered the most votes ever in the history of the, the university, <laughs> I guess. Um, and that had a lot to do with the fact I wanted to reach out to people other than simply the Caribbean folks uh, on, on campus. So I was a member of the Chinese Students Association, to give an example. And, and they, they sort of enveloped me, you know, they, they sort of encouraged me to, be, to learn more about the Chinese culture and to learn more about what they were try, striving to do as students on campus. They were one of the largest foreign student groups. One of the concerns that we had at the time was the, the governments uh, almost doubling their student fees around that time for foreign students. And so we, we protested against the Ontario government, arbitrary decision to raise student fees for foreign students. I felt that that was not just. So I, I have this, this notion of, of maintaining justice for people, even if it wasn't for myself, but for others. So I felt that the one way to do this was to become president of the Student Council, which I did, and then um, became um, the vice president of the Ontario Federation of Students and then became the secretary of the Canadian Federation of Students. So that sort of explained 
uh, how I sort of utilized that background that I had. Um, I tried to make it uh, into, into sort of the political realm uh, to make things happen uh, at this, in the student body. It sounds to me like because you had this example of leadership and of taking charge of things at a high level from the time you were little mm -hmm. and taking charge of things in all sorts of ways, you know, like directing the youth choir mm -hmm. is one way of taking charge, you know, becoming, saying, I'm going to work to be the president of the student council or whatever it is that, you know, you decided you were going to do. You yeah. right away thought, I can do my best work if I start from a high-level leadership position, right? I mean, that's what strikes me in what you're just saying right now. But, you know, there's something about this that's curious for me, too, because of looking back, it wasn't as though I wanted to become the leader. It wasn't ego-driven. I was reluctant to take on leadership roles, but, but sometimes the, the opportunity was there, and I felt it was necessary for someone to take that role, and I, I did it. And I did it because... I would desire to help other people, not to help myself. I, I wasn't going to, to do better in school because I was president of student council. In fact, it, it could have a draining effect on your academics, as I found out. But um, I, was, I was lucky to be able to balance things um, and, and still manage to get through my degree while being president of student council. But I learned a lot about that job, um, about management, about leadership, about the differences between a leader and a manager, which I, I think is something that... I, I kept uh, in the back of my head as I did my academics as well, because I ended up editing a book actually about management and leadership, which drew on some of that early thinking that went into my head when I was a student union leader. You had to be a combination of visionary leader and at the same time have the ability to manage properly. And that kind of skill is not easy to have in the bosom of one person. But I think the student union um, uh, activity taught me both skills, and I just learned how to do it from that. So let me just go back a little bit again to sort of your childhood and youth. And so what would you say were some of the influences of the childhood and youth in your ability to take charge of something, learn what you needed to learn, apply the necessary discipline, but stay creative? The thing that comes to mind is being part of a, a large family, because my, my family was a large family, um, six boys and two girls. You have to more or less learn how to listen to each other. Um, you have to learn how to consult uh, on doing almost anything that you want to do, whether it be going out to play a game, a sports, or, or going on a family vacation or whatever. There's always this notion of consultation, you know, with each other and, um, and listening to each other. Those are central issues for me uh, in, come, in terms of leadership, collaborating with each other, cooperating with each other. Um, minimizing the, the necessary conflicts that do exist in families. You know, we have, we, obviously, we, as families, we do have this ability to be conflictual sometimes, but we learn how to mediate, for example. I always tease my little sister uh, by saying that um, if it wasn't for me, she would have had a much more difficult time in the family because I was the one that was always the mediator between her and her big brothers, you know, so... So this idea of mediation, you learn the skill of mediation. It just comes inherently within you as you grow up. Uh, and of course, a lot of it has to do with the parents who instill those kinds of disciplines in us. I think it's a very important part of my growing up to realize that morals were very much central to our household. My parents wanted us to grow up to be ethical people. Try your best to live the best possible life you can while you're here on earth. That stayed with me, even through university years and sometimes a tendency to sort of move away, drift away from those kinds of principles. Uh, it's still stuck with you. I mean, dad used to always say, uh, train up a, ch a child in the way he or she will go. Uh, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. And that was a very f a fundamental message that I think is very true. Um, you, you train kids when they're little with these kind of ethics and morals. When they're older, it tends to stick with you. And uh, you have a, always have that little voice on your shoulder saying, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> and, uh, and it keeps you on the, on, on the straight and narrow. It sounds like your parents were very intentional uh, and conscious about creating a climate for moral grounding, uh, and yet one that encouraged 
because sometimes when people become very moral, they sometimes become almost fanatical or restrictive in the way that they allow the human spirit to express itself. But your family was not like that at all. Right. So they, it was like a strong moral grounding. And at the same time, this encouragement of and freedom of expression mm-hmm. with, within a framework that allowed you to continue to grow and develop, but didn't let you fall prey to, to dangerous influences. That's what it sounds like. To you me. know, looking back at it now, I think it's very purposive. You know, they, they had a very purposeful approach to training, to, to bring kids up. Mm-hmm. I always tell my wife, you know, we, we have done pretty well with our kids without any manuals. <laughs> um, you know, and, and it's true. I think most, most of us as parents, uh, we don't have manuals. So we have to do the best we can in terms of bringing our kids up. And the environment within which you live have a major impact on the kids. Uh, so I'm sure that they were very conscious of this, uh, the environment within which we live. There were some kids who didn't do very well. Um, in terms of becoming moral individuals or, or ethical individuals. Um, some, of, some of our friends ended up uh, going on drugs or something like this. And, and we wondered how come we didn't go in that direction. Well, our parents had a purposive approach to training us as kids to avoid things that would be detrimental to us, um, but at the same time not be so restrictive as to, as you say, fanatical, right, about it and allow us sort of creative freedom to grow up to be who we are. Mm -hmm. It's a great model. I think parents all around the world should follow that model. I look at my brothers and sisters, and they're training their kids that way too. And I think we're training our kids that way too. We we, we give them a lot of freedom to do what they want to do. In fact, we support everything that they want to do. Sometimes we would hope that they would do something differently, but you know, as, as good parents, we say, well, you know, this is what they like to do. Let's support them 100%. And, um, and usually, more often than not, they choose the right path. Right. Because you have confidence that they will, because they have a strong foundation. They have a good foundation, I think so. So let's go to the groups you chose to belong to. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, you have, a, you have a profession, you chose to belong to that profession, and I'm, I'm sure there, plus you had this interest in learning from other cultures. I mean, joining the Chinese Students Association yeah. and, yeah. you know, marrying marrying somebody from a different culture, very different culture from yours, yeah. like night and day difference, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and yet you have this strong, enduring marriage over all these years. Mm-hmm. So how did you do that? Like, what were these influences that you joined that became a part of who you are? Well, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there because I think part of growing up, there's a sense of tolerance and not just tolerance, but acceptance of different people, different cultures, uh, different kinds of ways of life, different religions. One of the things that I learned from my dad was that even although he was a very strong Protestant minister, he had this ability to preach in the Catholic Church, for example, he invited him to speak. He had this ability to be part of the ecumenical movement uh, of the Caribbean and therefore uh, accept different branches of the religion. Um, so I, I grew up thinking with the openness uh, to all different types of faiths and religions, um, I, I openness to different cultures. As you say, I got married to a Persian woman whose culture is very different from mine. Language is very different from mine. I got to meet her, actually, on her first day in Canada. Uh, she came to Canada as a refugee from Iran. And she came to Halifax, of all places, where I was doing my master's uh, in political science at Dalhousie University. And she came to do a uh, computer science degree at Dalhousie University. We met the very first day she arrived on campus. And not knowing that we would someday become husband and wife, but um, we got married. We have two beautiful kids uh, who are a blend, I think, of us in the sense of being able to operate in different cultures. I mean, my daughter and my son, they can operate almost in any different culture because they've been exposed to these differences in culture. When they're in, the, in Barbados, in the Caribbean with us, uh, they feel very much at home among their cousins who are Barbadian born. And uh, uh, when they are in uh, Tucson uh, or in Toronto, in the, in the Persian parts of Toronto or the Persian parts of Los Angeles or, or Arizona, uh, they are very much at home among the Persian community. They speak the language. Uh, they are comfortable with the culture, the music the dance, whatever. Um, so I think they, they got, the, got the best of both worlds in some ways. And uh, I think that's a blessing, actually. 
But, Basically. you know, I don't think I know too many Persians who would be comfortable in a marriage with somebody from Barbados. And I don't know too many people. <laughs> I, I mean, I think that people from Barbados and Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago tend to be pretty multicultural. But yeah. I don't know too many that just jump to marry uh, somebody from the Middle East, you know. So you well, must have adopted I, something from each other's cultures somehow, yeah, right? Sure, so what yeah. did you learn about Persian culture that allowed you to be comfortable or that, that you adopted into it? What do you think she learned from your culture? The, one of the things that have driven me over the years, whether really it be in the academic sphere or in just life uh, in Canada, is the importance of diversity and the unity in, in that diversity, that you can actually maintain a kind of a unified family or unified community, uh, even although people might be diverse. And that's because you can pick up on the strong elements of diversity and make it work for you. I think we are different, yes, between us and the Persians, but there are lots uh, of things that are similar too, in terms of how she was brought up and how I was brought up. The ethical, moral foundation, the leadership. That's right. I think that the important part of this idea of multiculturalism that you can have more than one culture in a community. We are kind of modeling that in our own family, right? So when we talk about multiculturalism, we talk about it from experience, not just theoretically about multiculturalism. When we talk about the fact that there could be unity and diversity, uh, we, we're talking about it from experience now, not from just a theoretical construct. So that I think that's driven largely what, uh, how we are and who we are. Um, a lot of my writing, a lot of my, my research is on multiculturalism in some way. Even you mentioned my work on children of war. Well, I got involved in that kind of project, uh, trying to understand what would it take to bring about a sustainable peace in countries that were torn apart by violence because of different ethnicities, different races, or different groups breaking the country apart. Uh, what would it take to bring them all back together again? And one of the things that gravitated me towards the children and, and war was that children are the most vulnerable in those kind of circumstances. We ought to pay more attention then to, to try to, to bring about the well-being of children in those circumstances. So I, that's how I got involved in that kind of project. It lasted about 10 years of really interesting research. And now I'm on to other kinds of research projects that also are very similar in some ways. Um, but I'm looking at um, countries like Nigeria and trying to understand why Boko Haram uh, a particular religious group uh, is causing so much anxiety and fear within that country. And what would it take to bring about sustainable peace in Nigeria? Uh, what would it take to um, de-radicalize individuals who would be radicalized by this particular branch of Islam, which is, doesn't represent the religion, as far as I'm concerned. It's much more sort of a very selfish kind of group uh, that's actually terrorizing the northern part of of Nigeria, but also now spread into the rest of the countries around Nigeria. So I think the research motivation is driven by a normative view that we ought to be able to find ways to build sustainable peace. And one way to do that is to be able to accept differences of culture, differences of religion, and realizing that we are all really from the same source. You are still practicing the mediator role that you had between your big brothers and your sister. You're helping people in conflict yeah. to yeah. see that they're part of the same family yeah. and how can we get on with this business of being human together and get past the ugliness into who we truly are, which would be all those opportunities to express ourselves creatively and to have access to education and work that's meaningful, right? I agree. And I think, you know, one of the things I always say about if my education remains at the theoretical level and doesn't affect the lives of ordinary people, then it's been a waste of time, in my opinion. I mean, it's nice to have theoretical constructs and you have to have some sort of foundation and some framework within your work. But I think it's important for you to be able to use that knowledge to help people in real life situations. Just this early summer, I was in uh, Colombia because the peace process in Colombia is falling apart. And we got invited by the mayor of Cartagena to come and speak there about building sustainable peace. And it came from one of the books I'd written about building sustainable peace. And I tried to sort of put into perspective what uh, this multicultural country that's now become Colombia uh, can do to bring about a peaceful settlement of disputes. And so people live in peace as opposed to the conflicts that they've had in the past. One of the things I discovered was that there's an Afro-Colombian uh, group in, in Colombia 
that hasn't been brought into the peace process. So here you have a peace process that's supposed to be for all peoples of Colombia, but a good percentage of the population have been left out of the consultation. And I stress the need to bring these folks into the discussion. And luckily we had the chance to meet with the president of the um, parliament and express those concerns to him. You can't have a peace in Colombia unless you bring in all these people that are in, on the margins of the peace process and bring them into the center of the discussion. And I think they took it very seriously. I don't think that one trip or two trips to Colombia would make a big difference, but I think at least it's planted a seed in the hearts and minds of some people of the importance of consultation and bringing people into the process and the discussion and decision making that needs to be done around this issue of peace. Well, if you take that back to the whole image of your family, if yeah. two of your brothers and sisters had just been excluded from every de decision in, you know, game or whatever your family was deciding to do, it would have probably brought about the complete dissolution of your family. When you think about it, if it happened once, it would have been a problem. But if it was happening on a regular basis, it would have dissolved the family integrity. Yeah. And so when we don't bring all the players to the table, that's the same effect. Yes, that's a very good point. And um, I'll tell you this little story that sort of affected the way we thought about gender. I know this is completely, it seems off the topic, but... No, it's all part of it. <laughs> that's the, the qualities of gender. Now, we had five brothers and two sisters. At the, around that time, uh, sort of being a, um, a lover of music, we loved the Jackson 5. And we thought that we could be imitators of the Jackson 5. In fact, we did a lot of their music as well for concerts and uh, for the radio and that sort of thing. Um, and we left out our sisters because... Why? Because there were no girls in the Jackson 5, right? So we left them out of the whole process. You couldn't imagine a music group that had girls in it and boys together because exactly. your yeah. model was the Jackson 5 or maybe exactly. the Osmond brothers on exactly. the other side. Exactly. We had the Osmond brothers and you had the Jackson 5. They're, they're all boy bands, yeah. yeah. But, you know, my sisters were tenacious. My sister, Grace, who is older than my younger sister, Joy, they were both tenacious and also very talented, too. Grace played the guitar as well as any of us played guitar. Joy played the violin masterfully. Actually, she's the best violinist in, in Barbados right now. I can say this not as a brother, being very proud of my sister, but from one of the leading violinists, Mr. Millington, who's now passed away, uh, took her under his wing because she was so talented at the violin. And she became the lead violinist for the, for the country's orchestra and so on. So, and she teaches almost anyone that does string instruments in Barbados. I mean, they made us realize that they were talented just as we are, and they ought to be included in the band as well. So we ended up having the Knight Family Band as opposed to the Knight Five or something like this. So they included by our sisters as well. So it was a good thing because they, they brought something additional to the music. It was even better. They made the music better. So... Um, I took this with me throughout my life, the importance of gender equality, the, the need to make sure that people are respected for their talents and abilities, regardless of their gender, uh, regardless of the color of skin. You know, I got that from my grandmother, who was light-skinned and looked very differently than me, but uh, we felt we embraced her all of our lives. And we loved my grandmother. And we could never hate someone just because of the, a different color of skin because we loved our grandmother so much. So, um, so I think this is part and parcel of, of who we are growing up as kids. I want to ask you about your temperament and your personality. So, you know, temperament's what you're born with. Mm -hmm. And personalities that accumulation of experiences and education and you deciding to arise to meet some challenge that comes up or deciding not to meet it. All of those things develop your personality. So it's always fluid, but the temperament's pretty much the same. Yeah. So if you're going to say temperament, what would you say you're kind of born with and then personality, what did you acquire? Well, I think in terms of temperament, um, I've always had this, um, and it goes all back to the reason why I became a mediator in the family <laughs> and, and a mediator in my academic life as well. Um, I was always very thoughtful about everything. I questioned things. I didn't accept everything that was told to me as givens. I sort of tend to stand outside prevailing understanding of things in order to be able to, to really observe what was happening and then make a decision about things. So I think that temperament part of me is very, very useful as an academic, especially if you're a critical academic. You know, there, there are some academics that are problem solvers. That's, you know, they just problem solve. I tend to be leaning on the critical side 
which is not to accept things as a given, not to accept that we are good, just because we were born into a particular circumstance that we have to remain in that circumstance all our lives. I mean, this, one of the things that I believe strongly is that uh, we need to sort of stand back outside the prevailing understandings of things in order to be able to critique what was happening and then decide to, how you want to respond, how you want to act. And I think this is very much part of who I am as a person. I, I, I tend to sit back and reflect on things a lot. Um, don't speak unless I really need to speak up on issues. Um, because I, I, sometimes I think we make mistakes by jumping in too early and saying the wrong things. So this reflective nature is part of my temperament, I think. And listening to both sides until you can form an opinion. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and being on the outside and looking in. Don't they call that being a public intellectual? Well, I think it's term? part of being a public intellectual mm-hmm. and also being able then to be able to express yourself properly. Mm-hmm. You've actually listen to all the different permutations out there and then you arrive at something that can actually make sense and then mm-hmm. you discuss that with the public. Um, this is what I try to do in my own work, and uh, I get called upon from time to time to be on the radio or, or television to make comments about what's going on in the world. And sometimes, you know, if you jump in too soon, and you make the wrong comments. So you have to be, you know, reflective about what you're going to say and, and, and then say the right things. Uh, you would have learned that from the political side of your family. <laughs> I think that's part of it. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty easy to make a mistake in politics that haunts you for the rest of your life. So what, what about personality? What have you acquired? What have you brought into your personality that you don't think you had before? That maybe some obstacle that you overcame? I'm kind of gregarious, uh, but it's not natural to me. I think I'm, I'm a little bit more shy than most people think. But one of the things I've learned is that in order to be able to, uh, to express myself in the public, I'm going to have to learn how to be able to associate with others and uh, communicate to others. So that part of it, I think, is something you learn as you go. Uh, you learn how to be a better communicator. You learn how to be a, a more gregarious person. Um, you learn how to, um, to do things in public when you feel like being by yourself. And it's, it's interesting because my artistic background tends to lead me towards that insular kind of state of being. But yet still, my political science background and my politics and student, politics and so on, leads me to more extroverted personality. So I have these twin personalities. One is very introverted and reflective. I want to observe nature, observe what I see around me, and try to see if I can capture as much of that as I possibly can through observation. And the other is to act and to do something that's meaningful. But do it based on the observation rather than just simply reacting, nilly really trying to get things done. Um, I, I do so with the motivation of having reflected on it before doing it. I don't know if that makes sense. It does. It yeah. does. So have you had a time when you felt, or there may have been many times, because you really you've gone all over the world, you've traveled, mm-hmm. you've seen really extreme conflict, mm-hmm. extreme poverty and violence, and at the same time, the Ivory League level of elitism yeah. And, you know, fame, performing on radio stations. You've seen all these different things. Is there a time you can think of when you felt disrupted culturally, where you felt that something you had assumed was normal was not normal for other people, that it just hit you in the face? A couple of things about that. Um, my first experience in Buddha Burum refugee camp in Ghana, this was after 10 years of civil war in Liberia and Sierra Leone and Cote d'Ivoire. All of a sudden, there were a whole bunch of... Um, IDPs, internally displaced persons, but also refugees, some of whom went to Ghana. And the Ghanaian government created a refugee camp uh, with the help of the UNHCR, United Nations uh, Human Rights Group, to try to bring um, some stability to these refugees that were flocking into uh, to Ghana. My visit there actually really disrupted what I thought about about refugees and the way I thought about people under those circumstances. And particularly the, 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 when I spoke with the young boys many of whom had committed atrocities. I mean, we were talking about serious atrocities, like having to be forced to kill your mother and father to show loyalty to the rebel leaders in Sierra Leone, for example, or the Liberians who basically, uh, as young kids, eight or nine years old, learned how to use AK-47s and commit atrocities in their own cities and towns. And then they found themselves in a refugee camp where some of those people were also living. So this tension between the people who had atrocities done to them and the people who committed atrocities was very, very much present. So I asked myself, how do you, how do you live in that kind of situation? How do you manage to sort of navigate 
in that situation. And it, I learned a lot uh, in that process. What did you talking, learn? Because this could help so many people. <laughs> so, so I, <laughs> Give me some lot, insights. <laughs> yeah, I learned a lot by talking to the kids. And uh, many of the adults didn't want me to speak to some of the kids. Uh, but I, I did spend time with the young guys who were now growing up. Now, they started at eight, nine years old as child soldiers, but they were now in the 20s or early 20s or, or late 20s. Many of them were, many of them said, you know, they didn't, never wanted to become child soldiers. They were forced into this. Uh, they committed atrocities, yes, but they didn't, it's not because they wanted to, but because of the pressure that was placed on them by these rebel leaders. And, and uh, it made me realize that people can be really, really terrible to other people. <laughs> um, you know, we can have crimes committed against humanity by individuals who have very selfish motives, and they bring in a whole bunch of other people with them as a result. So I try not to be too judgmental, even although I realize that people who commit atrocities ought to be punished for their crimes. I became a lot less judgmental listening to some of those kids and realizing that these are not the real source of the problem. Uh, it's deeper than that. So it's caught, got me on, on a different track now to think about what are some of these deeper reasons why these push factors and pull factors that cause young people to become almost like animals. Um, a lot of it has to do with how they are brought up, uh, the influences from outside, a uh, lot less to do with who they are really as people. I think they could be changed, they could be transformed. It's a particularly horrific thing to think that people can be so depraved that they would take young children and corrupt them. Yes. And yeah. the hope in that is that these children coming out of that situation would still wish to be different, would still want to discover who they were and to be a part of society in a way that, rather than just turning to addiction or suicide, right? right. I, I agree. And that's one of the reasons why I think a lot of my focus on some of my work is now on uh, reconciliation and recovery. How do, you, how do you build resiliency in people to be able to overcome those kinds of challenges and, and become, again, decent human beings brought back into civil society to live as decent human beings and, and to do good for others? I like what they've done in, in um, Rwanda, for example, with the Gakasha courts. Instead of having people tried in regular criminal courts and having them put to death for crimes that they committed and so on, they found a way to reconcile with the people who they committed atrocities against. And they've found ways in which uh, people who have committed atrocities and feel very sorry for what they've done, uh, first of all, acknowledge that they've done something wrong, ask for forgiveness, but then also pledge to work with the families that they committed atrocities against. And in that way, a healing begins um, on both sides. And I think this, it very much reminds me of the sort of indigenous people's uh, course, right? I think there's some wisdom in that kind of legal system that allows for people to heal from the depths of despair and this depravity and somehow find a way to become human again. Um, mm -hmm. And when you think about it, these children were often drugged. No matter how badly they were tormented and trained into cruelty, they couldn't do it unless right. they were drugged. It's such an abnormal state to be in. And when they come out of that drugged and abnormal state, it, in a way, it wasn't them who did right. it. I mean, yeah. not trying to pardon it, but I think the people who, that put them into that are the ones who are to blame. And I have met many Rwandan families where they yeah. ended up living on the same street with exactly that, mm -hmm. you know, the person who killed the aunt and the uncle in front of them or cut mm -hmm. their arms off. Yeah. And somehow they managed to see it as part of a horrific thing that happened to the whole country. Right. And that somehow the future generations would heal, that they were going to do their best to heal now. But it wasn't that likely they'd get through all of it, but right. that the next generations would heal. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought it was, that really gave me a lot of insights into how far we can go in the good yeah. side if yeah. we would just put our minds and hearts to it, right? Yes, exactly. And I think that's a very important lesson to learn from the Rwanda case. But also, right now I'm looking at um, the situation in uh, Nigeria. Uh, I just spent the last, what, July, August uh, in Nigeria, um, Ghana, uh, trying to understand why is it that young girls trained as suicide bombers to carry out these despicable acts, right, in state soccer stadiums, uh, in, in the police force, um, against the military or whatever, why some of them decided not to blow themselves up and to blow others in the, in the process. So uh, they were trained, they were indoctrinated, they, became, they believed in what they were doing, but then at the last minute, they changed their minds and decided not to carry out the bombing, even though they were strapped to their stomachs with explosives. 
uh, symbolic of the place that you give birth is a place that you blow everything up, you know? So, so it's, it's a fascinating project that we're working on now uh, with uh, Temitope Oriola, professor in sociology here at the University of Alberta, who's from Nigeria. So we've been working on this, trying to understand why is it that people would actually make that decision not to do what they were trained to do, the negative thing that they were trained to do. There's still some good in all of us, I think. And we need to be able to find that good. Uh, and uh, one of the things that helped me is, 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 is uh, you mentioned about the Baha'i faith. You know, the, the Baha'i faith is something that I gravitated towards. But I think there's some wisdom there in terms of how we can uh, find the good in people, regardless of what their backgrounds are, regardless of where they come from, regardless of what they've been exposed to. You can still find the good in them. And people want to do good. They're given the opportunity to do good. The influences from outside might cause them to do bad things, but I think at the end of the day, if you can get to their hearts and their, and their souls, um, uh, they may want to change and do good for others as well as for themselves. You know, what you just said reminded me of a couple of other Baha'is that I would also like to interview as part of this podcast, because uh, so many Baha'is have done amazing international work, uh, mm -hmm. you being one of them, of course. But um, so it's Michael and Judy Bopp, and they, you know, worked in situations where the depravity and the poverty was horrific, yeah. and the violence, and they would walk in and walk out unscathed. And I said, you know, like, what do you do? How do you even start with a situation like that, where everything is dysfunctional, there is nothing that seems to be functioning? Mm -hmm. uh, what do you do? And they said, you speak to the spirit and to the heart of people, and it always answers you back. I think that's the wisdom there in that particular quote there, because I, I think, yes, you have to go beyond the physical and talk to the heart. And this is something that uh, you have to learn how to do. Yeah, <laughs> and that's what you're doing in your research. Yeah. You're looking at these women, or right now, this is the current research, so I'm sure in all of them you have this grain of it somehow. Mm -hmm. You're looking at what people were able or unable to do, and when they arose to do something that was the better choice, the moral choice, what was it that gave them the awesome. courage to do yeah. that in a very difficult circumstance? I think that much of the world needs to hear that lesson, so I think mm -hmm. that your research is so important for that. Thank you. Yeah. So I have one question that seems so mundane in <laughs> comparison with all the things you've been saying already, but I mean, you are still employed by the university, right? Yes. So you do have an employer and you have been headhunted by other universities who wanted to have you. So if somebody wants to hire you, what do you tell them about what it would take to bring out the best in you? Well, that's a very good question because I'm being headhunted as we speak. <laughs> but um, I think they have to be able to accept that when I go into a new position, I will not be an ordinary professor of political science. Uh, I bring with that job many different dimensions. I'm not just a political scientist. I, I'm an artist. I'm a musician. I have multiple personalities, if you will, that it will bring to the job. So they have to be able to accept that kind of roundness in terms of personality. And, um, and I think some, many people do want to see that. Uh, you have to be able to be able to, to manage in different kinds of environments and so on. You have to be multicultural in most of these type of jobs, right? You have to be multicultural, being able to accept different people from different cultures. And you also have to, you have to bridge gaps and bridge differences between people because most of these jobs are now pretty senior management or administrative positions now. And uh, they want to be able to see whether or not you can actually keep people together who might be quite different and quite diverse in their populations, right? Uh, so I think I can bring some of that to the job. So if you ask me what I can offer those folks, I think I can offer this idea that we can mediate almost any difficult challenge in different circumstances if you just consult with each other, if you just listen to one another, and if you just work together towards a common goal, anything is achievable under those circumstances, I think. It's a great way to end our interview. Any closing comments uh, and, uh, or anything you'd like to promote before we close today? Well, I'm now co-editing this journal called African Security Journal. And I would like people to read that journal because it has a lot to do with Africa as a society that's transforming itself and changing in a very, very rapid way. You know, Africa has undergone a lot of problems as a result of colonization and uh, people just ripping the place apart and, and siphoning off resources to the first world. The continent itself is still one of the richest places in the world and still has great diversity and strengths that we need to be able to draw from and draw out. One of the challenges it has, of course, is the insecurity problems uh, that we need to try to address. So I'm trying to find ways of uh, addressing those. And I think our work in the African Security Journal is going to do a lot of that, help to bring sort of conceptual thinking, theoretical thinking to real world problems. 
and to the process. So I'm trying to combine theory and process, if you will, through that journal. And I think we're, we're trying to do a, a, a good job on that. I'm co-editing with uh, Temitope Oriola, the same uh, Nigerian scholar I told you about. And between the two of us, we're trying to, to make a difference in that area. So, and then they have a book coming out soon on this problem of uh, female suicide bombers who did not detonate. I just wrote one book on female suicide bombers who did detonate. It was a very, very challenging book because they were successful in, in what they were doing and therefore they're not around to tell the story. But I think this new one, the people who actually can tell the story about the reasons why they did not detonate their bombs is going to be very, very interesting as well. So I'm hoping to have that out sometime next year. Well, Adi, it's really been an honor. And I appreciate so much you taking the time out of your day to do the interview. And I'm going to make sure that I include every link that I can to these works that you've got. So anything that you can provide to me that would help people to find them quickly so that they can access them. Because usually if people give up looking for a resource, it's because it's some kind of a logistic thing in the way. So so if we got some good links, then they can go to them fast. So thank you so much for taking the time. And I really learned a lot and I'm very excited to see your new work coming out. Thanks, Marie. And thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. such an interesting interview with Dr. Andy Knight just now. It makes me think that there is a certain family orientation and vision that must be carried forward from one generation to the next and continues to influence excellence across disciplines. I was also struck by the well-rounded approach to art, music, religion, politics, social justice, and academic research that characterize Andy Knight's work and life. Dr. Knight's life is an example of balance while bringing an excellence and focus unique to him and his style. He has truly taken the foundation of multiple group influences and forged them into a leadership style that makes him a sought after intellectual with a reputation for problem solving. I very much enjoyed this interview and I'm thrilled to tell you that Dr. Knight has sent photos of his artwork and links to all his books. You can find them in the podcast show notes and also on our Work and Culture Facebook page. Speaking of following, I would like to say a special thank you to those listeners who subscribed and who reviewed and rated this podcast and to those who share the episodes they hear with their friends. Our team goal is to reach a thousand listeners by the end of our first season, and your rating and sharing really helps us spread the word about Culture and Leadership Connections podcast. You can leave a review on Apple Podcasts, on our Work and Culture Facebook page, or you can send me an email about the episodes that personally touch you. Go to marie at shiftworkplace.com to send that message. Thanks for listening, and may cultural connections continue to broaden, deepen, and inspire your world. have I got a great surprise for you. It is our Future of Work, three stellar articles that will explain how you can stay current and skilled now and in the future of work. We have three pieces to this. It's a free download called The Future of Work. And in part one, I talk about how people and machines came to be in relationship together and how the gig economy affects everything. In part two, I talk about the relationship between Industry 4.0 and emotional labor and what you will need as far as skills are concerned in the tech and soft skills for the future. And in part three, I talk about a 2020 vision for the future of work, which is going to help us move forward into a future that is kinder and more oriented towards humanity living in relationship with its environment, along with some very practical suggestions for how to get there. I know you're going to love it, and you can easily download it by going to this link. The link is shiftworkplace.co slash future of work white paper. Let me say that again. It's shiftworkplace.co slash future of work white paper. Grab your copy today, and I would love it if you get back to me and let me know what you think.